Yeah. I'll Sorry, ask. I just wanted to uh, mention that. Uh, Hi, Anna. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, pleasure, pleasure to have you here. I'm like really like your projects, um, and was happy uh, that Anika suggests you to have here. So I just want to mention that Ilya Herzhenovsky, our artistic director, is. Uh, driving from uh, uh, Dnieper. Uh, oh, yes, I, I'm yes. here. Yeah, so he's in the car. Oh, wow, and this is nice. <laughs> <laughs> great to see uh, everyone. And um, uh, thank you for coming to our architecture board. Uh, and uh, greeting to Austria, please. <laughs> from the middle of Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs> I never tradition every architecture board. I think I'm always in the car. I think I never almost been somewhere. Almost, yeah. Don't Once why, you've been it's... here in Kiev. <laughs> <I don't laughs> yes. But I'm going and coming to Kiev. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, thank you. And I hope that I can, you know, answer your uh, your expectations, you know. Well, so, I mean, Milica, to, to give you a bit of like a, a, a background and kind of what we've been doing um, over the past five or six weeks, we've been having a series of presentations from different people, both within and, and from outside the board, um, mm -hmm. which have been dealing with different um, with different issues that relate to this, uh, to the site and to the task we have at hand. Um, Robert Jan made a presentation about uh, Jewish space, Jewish architecture, um, which unlike Christian and Muslim space does not really exist within the mind or within the canon of architectural history. Um, so we were thinking through what that might look like or what that might mean. Um, Troy gave a presentation uh, about um, kind of uh, kind of ancient principles of spatial orientation, I would say, um, kind of how certain architectural structures um, and, and, and territories have been shaped through um, more, let's say, animist or vitalist principles, also cosmological and, and astrological principles. Um, so uh, so in, in a way, like how to kind of attach, both of these presentations were very much dealing with how to attach meaning to, to architecture. Um, Marina Otero gave a presentation on, uh, which is probably the closest one to what you're going to be speaking about on the history of architectural foundations. So how a building touches the ground um, you know, as, as you, as you know, um, you know, the, this site, we are effectively treating this entire site as a, you know, as, as a burial ground, um, within the Jewish tradition, that also means that you are not allowed to touch the ground. You're not allowed to, to kind of desecrate the ground above which people are buried. Um, but so basically it, within this, this, this project that we're working on, the site is kind of the main museum the site is the is the exhibition itself but uh but you know things don't speak for themselves i mean they or we they either we either need to to teach ourselves how to listen or we need to find some way to, to make them speak um and so i think we're, we're very uh curious to hear about your work um you know in allens and beyond about how do you how do you make how do you how do you read the ground and how do you work with with soil um, as you know, the kind of ultimate repository of history um, mm. and of violence and of and of trauma. Mm. Okay, I'm going now to share the screen, and you know, and you tell me what you see. You know. Yep, we see your desktop. Okay, and how can I? Do you see the whole one, or you know how? No, it's just like a beige. Mm -hmm. Okay, but do you see this? Something white? No. No, Nothing. no, no, no. Okay, great. Super. Okay, I'm going to close this. Um, uh, yeah, so like, uh, I, I, I really hope that I will, that I will, that I will, um, you know, um, somehow answer your expectations, but um, as you said, that actually you're interested. Uh, this is the concept that I was having in my mind when I started this, um, was first at the travel's edge. And I will explain this. This is connected to archeology span and especially for post-processual archeology. span But actually 
um, uh, the, the, the title of this whole conception is, is I tried to name it, but I'm searching for a name, but it's now investigative memorialization, but not investigative in the sense of you're looking for evidence and for a proof to claim the, the site of atrocity, uh, but actually investigation in a sense of uh, like referring to uh, Wittgenstein and Kossuth and his idea of investigation of, of, of transformative process. And this is like also con con like somehow connected to conceptual art and the idea of the transformation of all involved. So uh, in, in the project, you know, and this was the first time when, 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 when in art, people started talking about projects. Um, uh, I started, I started uh, um, uh, this affluence memorial project that is so, where the concept of soil as archive was defined at the very <clears throat> beginning. And I was invited actually in 2013. And this was exactly after the night we had with Robert actually in Belgrade. I was invited to Afflens for a, to work in a, in a lab for several days. And at that time, uh, so I was invited, this is like Afflens and their son, a place of a former camp. It is a Mauthausen auxiliary camp. And the mayor wanted actually the city mayor, um, his name is Peter Stradner. And I am saying this because this is such a rare situation in Austria, an extraordinary situation. He wanted to build a memorial at the place where the barracks, uh, where the detainees were captured, the fenced area actually, because this whole area is a bit bigger. I will explain this like uh, very, very briefly. So, uh, and he's also a Mauthausen guide, you know, this is the, um, so, Milita, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, are we supposed to be seeing any images right now or no? Actually not, but okay, I, can, okay. I can show you. No, 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 sorry. I, I just wanted to make sure that everything was set up. Before. No, I was thinking, you know, maybe I should not show you anything. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. I mean, no, no, no. This is like, I can show you this, but this is like just that you're uh, looking at something at this point, you know. So uh, um, just, are you talking about milk? I just didn't hear it. Sorry, which, I didn't... which which camp were you talking about? Milk, this subcamp at Milk? No, this is the Afflens Memorial. Oh, okay. uh, sorry, the Afflens and their song. Okay, thanks. So, being there, you know, I don't know. It it somehow it's very slowly, and this doesn't move. These images don't move. Um, if I if I look so much at this, this won't be so good. Yeah. Can you see it? Or I yeah, no, we, we can see it, but, but if it distracts you or anything, then, then just feel free to take it off. It's, uh, no, it's yeah, because, because I think it's more important that I'm now, you know, talking about this uh, because it's, it's also somehow um, uh, an important moment, you know, because you know, this is, you're looking now at the woods, you know, but this is another uh, like place, but uh, this place, this countryside of Austria is extremely beautiful. And in particular, the site of the concentration camp. So when you're there, you cannot simply imagine that anything happened there that can break and disturb, you know, this idyllic hilly landscape, a forest, a brook, a small stream that you will probably, um, what do you say? Sorry. I, no, it was I not. Heard. Okay. Um, and so, while having, you know, this immense pleasure by looking at this landscape, really nothing suggests that this woodland, you know, that you're, that you're seeing now is actually, you know, a place of, uh, is actually a site of a mass grave. And that today this cornfield patches 70 years ago were used uh, to be concentration camp barracks. I will show you this, but um, so from 1943, 
onwards, the bombing and, and, and airstrikes uh, against German Reich was an ongoing thing and very intense. And many companies um, of the Third Reich moved their production underground. And they were looking actually for shelter for a continuation of, a, of a production. So the whole idea was actually uh, the company uh, like in Graz, which was at that time Steyr Dammler Puhage, which was the first arms producing company in early uh, 42, that was using actually concentration camp laborers uh, uh, and uh, like on Mindel's suggestion, who was a director at that time and was opening the whole idea and the conception of the auxiliary and labor camps. So this Steyr Dammler Puhage, today it is uh, Magna Steyr, and this is a subs diary of Canadian based Magna International. And they called themselves, this is really like a paradox, children of war, as they have, you know, some orphans of war or not historical protagonists of exploitation and extermination. You know? So th this is this crazy, you know, moment also in Austria, just that it, it works, you know, they're also financing my school, uh, for example. And this is also the moment where, you know, I brought this also in the school. Sorry, this is another, another. <laughs> I'm going to, to close this now. Um, so um, this this uh, so they moved actually uh, the, the, from Graz Tondorf to this ancient Roman quarry in the Afflans and their zone. And at that time, caves were adapted uh, by 200 detainees that were brought from outhouse and concentration camp, and to build this. First, the barracks for them to, to continue living there and to work. It was in the November, like late November. So they were, uh, they were uh, building and actually adapting these caves for the machinery and the production. And also building barracks for, five, for like 2,000 people who were coming from Graz. They were ordinary workers. And then later, there were also forced laborers, uh, uh, forced labor all around occupied territories. They were also brought to this site. And actually, uh, this was also part of this, of this investigation. We, 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 this was not so known in this moment. Um, and uh, in 1945, at the end of the war, barracks were dismantled and they were used in for diverse needs or, or sold uh, for uh, to, to, as complete objects, you know. Uh, so there is this wonderful research by a historian Bertrand Pert uh, on this afterwar history of the barracks in Austria. So from that time, there was a total erasure of the history of the Katze Afland, except Franz Trampusch, who is one of the, the only witness and who was seven years old kid at the time. And he was actually living in the village. Uh, and his mother was somehow helping and bringing always food to the detainees. And she was also captured because of this. Uh, and in, uh, so at the end of the war in, in 45, so till today, there is, nothing so everything is erased and there is just a beautiful countryside panorama with these agricultural estates so at the first glance the only memory and the only trace we have today is this agricultural land soil and that what grows so the life of crops on the site so the memory and the experience we also have in the mind of the seven years old kid that is today an 87 years old man. And the entire knowledge and the archive remains actually in the soil that grows crops. And the question is actually how to produce and assemble this subjugated, you know, it's not the knowledge that has to be, you know, like an academic or, so it's a knowledge actually an experience and insight that are speaking in the name 
of the future memorial. So because I was invited also to, to, to talk about this and to, to think how if I could do something. So, and the, there is a question also, how can we think about the memorial not, not, not in a static forms of contemporary, of, you know, of commemoration practices or reconciliation, because this is an important issue here that we are trying not to do this that actually, especially reconciliation and these frozen relations, you know, of the victims and per perpetrator. So this static form of the commemoration that, stay, that says, you know, this happened here and should never happen again. So this couldn't be a model anymore. It cannot be actually a model. And it's actually never enough to get into or even start understand, understanding, you know, the, the site of, of the traumatic history. So my experience working on memorialization on two durational projects, so both are interdisciplinary, collective endeavor, helped a lot to understand the relationship between the unmarked site of, of the injustice and the nature that grows out of it. So the the one is, you know, the importance of soil in this project, Four Faces of Omarska, where, you know, you, you've seen it, it is a building a new landscape as a film set at the site of atrocity and made actually by those who are not recognizing the car, a crime and actually taking part. Can, in, I, can in I just it. interrupt? I'm still looking at the picture of the trees. Yeah, I, yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, okay, I just don't know, because I have it with my students. I, I don't know if you're still moving or not, but... Yeah, I can, I can no, show I guess you. not. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. this is affluence, you know, mm -hmm. uh, shown... Of, this is the only photo of affluence, actually. And uh, this is made by the, you know, air, air, air photo by the Americans when they were actually... Uh, coming at the end, you know. We're, 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 that we don't see. We still see like the video that you took from the woods. Ah, really? Yeah. Uh -huh. And I don't say any more of this. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if you stop sharing and share again. Okay. Just like reload it. What do you see now? Now nothing, because you stopped sharing. Okay, I stopped sharing. <laughs> okay. Now? Yeah, now we see the aerial photograph. Okay, super. So, so this is this photo, you know, that, that shows, and this is actually, these are some plans, you know, um, of how it was, it was envisioned, you know, with much more barracks. And this was actually also this part that was part of the, of the, of the workers coming from Graz, you know, they brought, and this is like a larger, by the end, we had just this part, you know, and I will leave you this picture now and just to, to talk about these other projects that you just understand. So, um, so this, I, I was talking about the landscape and the film set that was, you know, made out of the landscape where mass graves were still not excavated and, and the site in Bosnia. And Grupa Spomenik, uh, the monument group that is Yugoslav-based art theory group, whose focus was the politics of memorialization, the wars in, against Yugoslavia and the post-genocidal society. So, I, so for, for, for you and actually for Aflan, this experience and encounter with the work of the International Commission for Missing Persons at the site of Srebrenica genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and their huge interdisciplinary, you know, forensic teams that were reassembling remains of the victims out of tertiary and secondary mass graves. They started their work in 96, and then they developed a super sophisticated methodology that influenced a big turn in forensic practice that was established in the case of Srebrenica. So, it was a big turn in this moment also. So we were following their work and methodology from the very beginning. And one of the most complex experiences came out of the, with, the, with the work with the archeologists and their ways of discovering mass graves through changes of nature 
and establishment of a homogeneous, you know, ecosystem that brings different plants like warm wood, for example, or blue butterflies together on these sites. So how soil responds in relation to the sites of historical trauma and what reveals from there. This, is, this was something that I learned for the first time, that this was also the way they were recognizing, you know, all this, all this, uh, all these mass graves, you know, and that was actually impossible. There were, nobody wanted to witness uh, for, for this from the perpetrator side and uh, the genocide happened actually. So uh, there were no witnesses actually. So in this way, who were willing to talk about this. So everything was based on that, what grows. So in this way, instead of, you know, inept historical, inept, you know, historical closure through memorialization, this atrocity or anti-event is understood as a spatial and, and some kind of the temporal continuity, which positions not only landscape, but specifically soil, both what it contains and what it sustains, you know, as the crucial and active agent in the process of learning and understanding what is this site, you know, about. So affluence has these cornfields, you know, covering the site of the former labor camp and that camp and the mass grave that is already being excavated. So there is nothing except this wood that you were looking for such a long, you know, time here on this screen. So, I mean, I don't also to be, to, to be sound dark, but you, are, you, you, you have 100,000 bodies that are still not excavated and you're not allowed to excavate as I understand. So, um, and this is an interesting question. I was for a long time, you know, thinking, you know, excavation or not, and how do I relate to this? But as an artist and also as somebody who is so involved, you know, in, So in this sense, because soil is an active archive that allows us to read not only the history, but also the present and its aftermath. And at the beginning, you know, of this, uh, of this project in Affluence, as I said, I was convinced that one should not touch, you know, this ground there, um, especially where the concentration camp was. And then, uh, mm, I was actually also introduced during the work with the monument group with, uh, with post-processual archaeology that is actually reflexive and interpretative archaeology that assemble and, you know, um, um, it is actually a kind of it, it was it was developed by by few people so and i'm talking now about those who i was impressed with and this is michael shanks lynn meskel and ian hooder that you probably know and their work started in manchester in the 70s and early 80s so they were generating a theory on the on the excavation start out of tools and archaeological practice and continuing later their work at Stanford and having different, you know, uh, where I met them at that time and having different collaborations. So Jan Huder, and I would love to show you this photo actually. Um, uh, can you see this? And he, he actually developed his theory and practice like even more in Chatal Huyuk uh, the Neolithic settlement located in Konya and, and uh, a plain, uh, like Konya plain uh, on, uh, of central Turkey. And he was there from 93 and he was supervising actually this research project. And it was actually shedding light on how one of the world's earliest societies, because this is the site that we know as, as a society, made the transition from hunting into farming a settlement and how it was organized socioeconomically by employing, you know, contextual archaeology. So exploring the relationship between people and things, you know, now we have this, but this was in the really like early 
they started on this in early 80s and late 70s. So the key points of post-processual archaeology are about concerning material culture and materiality of a social fabric and in a way how art artifacts, artifacts act as social agents and how they are questioning the character of human agency. So it is about the construction of the objects of archaeological interest through discourse and the relation that establish a context. So in this, it is the fundamental symmetry of past and present. You have both in one. And this was very much opposed actually to the traditional archaeology that is based actually beliefs in uh, objective statements, science, archaeological investigation, invest investigation, and is based upon evidence, you know, as, as, a, as the ultimate truth. So post-processual archaeology questions this stance and sees archaeology as a subjective rather than objective. And this is, for me, the crucial point, actually, this awareness of those who are actually. So I will just say, and this is like, I will quote now uh, Michael Shanks and also Jan Huder, uh, who are saying people and the realm of the social become material and object world nature acquires a history of different relations with people. So there is nothing, like, mm -hmm, sorry. So there is nothing pur purely social or technical, human or non-human. There has not been a pure human social relations for perhaps over two million years. And this is actually beautiful in in you know entering the soil and this whole concept of uh, the trowel edge at the trowel edge you know the way the moment you put the trowel into the into the soil and that what you take out in this moment for the first time it this actually the, the contextualization starts so um, so it's very it has a very artistic let's say uh, approach that is very close, as I said, to 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 this concept of of investigation, you know, in relation to Kossuth. So, so, so in this moment, when you read this, the whole colonial imperial perspective on history, you know, hierarchical systems, the class and gender that was informing, you know, archaeology from the beginning of this discipline was definitely transformed, you know, forever. And especially because for us or for, for me, the most important moment in this, in this whole idea of the, of the labor camp is actually that this is not a state of exception, is actually, you know, colonial practices coming back to, to European soil. And it's, it's something that it has its continuity. So, so the whole project is actually thought from this perspective, from this idea. And I think this is crucial for, for them how to deal with soil, how to deal with, with the material. Um, So, 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 you know, genocide and the Holocaust and, the, and over every, you know, so it's a continuation of these colonial practices. And it actually, you know, informs, informed so many things and still, you know. So, um, so during 2017 and 18, uh, I made this exhibition, which was exhibiting at the trowel's edge towards an investigative memorialization. So I was searching for this, you know, what, what does it mean actually? So we started, we had this opportunity and this was really like great to start an archeological site, the excavation on the locality of the concentration camp, but not at the part where the, where the inmates were, but where the workers actually barracks were, these 2,000 workers. And, um, and we were lucky, and you will understand this, that on this side, we have found actually a garbage pit. 
from the Second World War. So it was, and this garbage pit, you know, this is like you won a lottery or you robbed the bank, you know, this is so much in this, you know, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, really special. So a small almost, uh, so, okay, I will, I will show now some, some photos that will maybe help. Um, can you see this? Yeah, probably. Yep. This is this archaeological site. And actually what was happening there, we were invited to do so because, um, because it is actually today, it has to become uh, like uh, housing, you know, they're building there. And so this was an opportunity to claim this also as a historical site and to, to you know, to excavate. This is, for example, from Ukrainian, uh, you will see just the name. His name is, uh, his name is actually Laranov Leonid, or Fish Laranov Leonid. And it was actually, uh, we, we found this uh, identification card and this he was, so we, so we also learned a lot about uh, about um, forced laborers. So okay, uh, so just that you have a feeling, and these are these big objects that are usually, you know, like. Uh, but then actually, uh, the result of the excavation and flotation. So okay, so. Mm, we have this big remains and I can show you these are this is a whole list of really like everything that one would throw into the pit is the garbage pit, you know. Uh, but this almost invisible, you know, archaeobotanical and zooarchaeological uh, zoo residues and seeds helped us actually to understand and learn not just about the site of affluence and their song and its past, but also about the space in between the closing of the camp in 1945 till today. So for, for us, this was even more important moment, you know, to understand actually what happened there. And the results of the excavation and flotation. Do you know what is flotation? Do I have to explain this? Uh, we, we saw a photo of it in the other slide, right? Where you kind of, you, where you, uh... Of sinking yeah. In water. Yeah. yeah, you have here now this photo. So this is the way you you can get all these small residues, you know, and how you deal with this actually, uh, because they're floating and it's a very simple thing. But but that what you get from there, it's huge actually. Um, and you know, this is also this kind of intervention. This is a question, you know how you deal with your soil, you know, on, on this place. This is also something uh, because, you know, this archeological, let's say uh, uh, like uh, uh, in 70 years, you don't have more than 40 centimeter, you know, 30, maybe 20, you know, that, that grew there. And at the other hand, you know, you have also, um, uh, you have these carrots that are really, but we can talk about this. This is, I don't know what, it, I know the thing is uh, a, a principle, also religious principles, but yes, okay. So um, this result of the excavation and, and flotation led us to the major question related to property law and ownership reconfiguration that shifted actually uh, and the whole shifts that happened also in the labor law and the vortex of relations around Steyr Damler Puch and Steyr Magna. Uh, I will also, but I can mention this later because this what I learned also from Alfredo Gonzalez Rui Bal, who introduces these different forms of soil and the memories they preserve, which is then mud, you know, fecal sludge, sand, 
spot us all. He claims actually counter memory in opposition to the concept of blood and soil, you know, this valuable soil. And this is then interesting, you know, what, what one can learn from, from that what is rejected, from that that is disjunct. Um, so seeds and light residues that one can find on the site leads to the us. So we were we were led actually to the cultivation and production of edible crops or of animals for food, agriculture, farming, and new types of animal breeds and strains of crops developed in the laboratories that were placed in the same, in the very close to this area of affluence, you know. Uh, and their soul. So with the aim to create a sustaining a new racial and fascist regime. So to support these ideas and refinancing law was introduced in 39, which removed the whole financial pressure from, from the farmers, which is called in Austria Bauer, and which has to differ, you know, from this American idea of the farmer. So until 39, so they were, they were refinancing the debts of 90% of all agricultural operations in Austria into cheap long-term state loans worth around 100 million Reichsmarks at the time. And the agricultural landscape of Styria was changed by these laws totally. And this law was living till 1999. So for us, you know, going from the seeds and, and the soil and then going, and I had really a, a, at that time student and he grew up with this research. And, um, and I also introduced, actually we had also two courses that were uh, working with this and also then involving more people. And I think in, as you know, this is Philip Sattler. He was really helpful and really great in doing this research around all this documentation and all this uh, enormous material. Also in, 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 together with uh, Bernard Pertz, you know, the historian. So this Reichs, Reichserbhof uh, Gazette protected bigger estates while about thousand smaller estates were auctioned off annually. So the land, the land owned, you know, by Jewish states, Yugoslav, kingdom and others, they're all expropriated and actually are ironized, uh, ironized in 1942. So this change of property relations and the way agriculture in Styria was restructured with the goal to increase the yield, the implementation of reorganized ownership of the agricultural land, the tightly connected to the Nazi ideology of blood and Boden, which is like blood and soil, based on the idea of the racial superiority of the Nordic Aryan race. So through the very concrete implementation of the set of laws, this um, like uh, the writer uh, at, that, at the beginning, at the very beginning, which is Richard Walter Dare, uh, he wrote a book with the same title, it's Blood and Soil, who actually in 33 became a Reichs Minister for Food and Agriculture in the German government. So, so he could, he was able to implement actually these laws. So the flotation and looking at the smallest light residues led this research to property and ownership laws, construction of the, at the same time through this, a construction of the new entity the class, the new class that was established at the time, which is actually a new aristocracy in Austria, the Grossbauer. So it is still in power. So the Grossbauer is an untouchable figure, you know. So investigative memorialization that is coined as this non-commemorative, transdisciplinary and collective approach um, is actually uh, looking looking in this direction. So we were also very much like uh, uh, relaying and, and also uh, discussing and, and, and also with him and reading his book, Tiago Sarajeva. I don't know, probably you know, he, he's a historian 
who wrote this beautiful book, Fascist Pigs, Technoscientific Organisms and History of Fascism, where he claims that ideology and societal changes are developed directly in the labs and describes how fascism uses history, but a streamlined version, you know, revision version of history in order to ground the ideology uh, on the scientific foundation to claim the truth, you know, the only truth. So, yeah, I will end here and probably you will have some questions and I hope that I was any help, you know, with this. Even not showing any photos. If I can. Yeah, thank you. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> you did show photos. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I, will, I will try to 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 to, to uh, see if I have something that can be interesting for you. Yeah, this is the site actually where the excavation. Yeah, Milito, can I ask what what is the current status of this site? Um, so you 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 said that you performed these excavations in 2017, 2018, and then um, that there was an exhibition in uh, in in Karaz. Um But yeah, so what 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 happened after? What happened after you were able to to kind of excavate all this material or what what does the site look like now and what's your relationship to it as well yeah but you know it is uh, it is actually you know i was using uh, at the same time we are developing after that actually we we made this conference and i was making this together with dubravka that you that you know also uh, so <clears throat> we were doing this really a conference where we tried actually to prove this moment, you know, of this claim that was so important actually that this is not an exceptional state, you know, that 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 labor camps are, are uh, not labor, but concentration camps and the whole, you know, the production of, of death, you know, and labor together is a status of, you know, is actually a continuation of, of, of colonial practices. So, so we, were, we were trying to unpack this idea and also inviting to discuss these property issues because this was for us a most important moment also in relation to this, to this labor camp. So we are now, you know, I'm, I'm just showing now some photos that we maybe we can. Um, uh, that that helped us a lot, you know, to um, to understand also how we can how we can deal with these moments of um, uh, you know how to how to understand these sites in a proper way, and how actually then out of this to understand the crops and again go back into the soil and the and the nature actually or not nature, you know, because there is no, like, it, everything is, of course, uh, you know, there is an intervention everywhere. Uh, but but to, 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 to see out of this, how to deal with this object of memorialization. So I was lucky, really lucky that I, I, I have this fantastic understanding of, of the mayor and all the people involved in this project from, you know, Steirish of Hebst and, you know, all the people who were, um, yeah, this is this exhibition of the Steirish of Hebst. We have also, you see, you see this. Uh, so this was not on this, this is this site where the, where, the, where, the, where the forced laborers and the workers of Graz were sleeping and living, you know, they were, they were living in the barracks and working actually in the caves, which was like 500 meters from there every day. They were working in like, it was, I don't know, around two degrees, three degrees uh, in the caves. They were producing enormous. Uh, so we are trying now, you know, Okay, I'm going to explain. Uh, it's not important now for now, but uh, what we are going, what we are doing now, you know, we are trying to understand actually to go more deeper into the soil, but actually on the site now where the where the camp was, where the fenced part of the camp was. Mm. So this is now 
in our, but there are a lot of problems, you know, Austria is made out of, uh, you know, things that you can maybe make on the other side and maybe not. So they have to establish this site as a historical moment, you know, as a historical importance. Mm -hmm. So they still didn't, didn't succeed this in order for us to get there, you know, and to, um, yeah, his name is Visharnov Leonid. Is this like Ukrainian name? Leonid is uh, is Russian. Uh, could be also Ukrainian or uh, uh, Belarus. Mm -hmm. Maybe Belarus. Yeah. Yeah. These are these you know this light residue and heavy actually, which is which helped a lot to actually meet and learn about, about the place, especially about this special seeds, you know, that were produced at that time. So. Can, can I respond? Can I respond with, yes, a, uh, with a quote? Yeah. Uh, this is from uh, Hans Joost. Hans Joost is a, uh, a German writer who was very famous for a play that he created, Schlageter, that he created in the early 1930s, which is about a Nazi, uh, early Nazi who dies in 19, who's executed in 1923 by the French during the occupation of the Ruhr. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and this is where you have the famous quote ascribed to Goering, wrongly ascribed to Goering, when I hear the word culture, I, I draw my browning, I get my gun. So Hans Joost became a very good friend of Himmler mm -hmm. in the 1930s. He was chief of the Reich's uh, writing chamber, the right, uh, author's chamber. And in 1939, after the uh, conquest of Poland, uh, Himmler makes a trip through occupied Poland. And uh, uh, Hans Joost accompanies him. And he actually creates a, keeps a journal of that trip. And Himmler, of course, is, first of all, not only the chief of the SS as the man who's going to run the Holocaust, but also he's the man who has to actually settle peasants in the East. He is in charge of the Germanization of the soil in Poland. Yeah, as Raskommissar für die Festigung für Deutschen Volkstums. Uh, he has to create all these farms in this occupied uh, German farms in occupied German territories. And... Um, so that he brings together, so the farming and the genocide comes together in his, in his person. There's a personal union between him as chief of agriculture in the East and the settlement of peasants and chief of the Holocaust. So here is the first quote. And this is, uh, they're traveling through Poland. Yeah. The landscape of the East, that Poland, laid out without the horizon while the breath of the cold pushes mist and fog over these treeless plains. This monotonous landscape seems melancholic and abandoned by love to us who are used to hills and the contrast between forests and cheerful villages. Suddenly poverty has done only the absolutely necessary. The gardener's care is absent. Fences and roads are neglected. But these fences and roads are much more than random testimonies. They betray character and culture. One must have traveled for days over these Polish roads to understand the death sentence that history pronounced over the Polish state. An organism that has no understanding for its arteries, for its blood circulation and its blood pressure must collapse. That is the most natural law of the world. Here it has manifested itself once more. So that's the first piece. And so you see in the car was Himmler. Yeah? Now they are on, the, on route from Wuch to Warsaw. We were en route from Wutsch to Warsaw. Repeatedly, the Reichsführer SS, Himmler, stopped the car, climbed over the striated ditches, walked into the fields, plowed over by grenade shells, took some dirt between his fingers, smelt it thoughtfully with inclined head, crushed the crumbs of the field between his fingers, and then looked over the vast, vast space, which was full to the rim with his good fertile earth. Thus, we stood like ancient farmers, and we smiled at each other with twinkling eyes. All of this was now German soil. 
Here, very soon, the German plow will change the appearance of the land. Here, soon, we'll plant trees and hedges. Shrubs will grow, and weasels, hedgehogs, buzzards, and falcons will prevent that mice and other vermin will eat half the harvest. Thus, we stand on the fields, hold conquered soil in our hands, and gaze over the whole of this indifferently treated land. We'll populate them with villages surrounded by rustling orchards. The West cannot understand this pure pleasure that we derive from a great task and the prospect of much work, sweat and calluses. It thinks in terms of business and turnover, but we look forward to action. It seems somehow appropriate, these, <laughs> these lines. Yeah, and can you can you just tell me again the name? I didn't I didn't write it down. I didn't. It's Hans Jos. I can send you uh, I can send you the Hans H A N S Joost. Mm -hmm. This is my okay. translation. This okay. is my translation. Uh, it is uh, it is a his his report of his journey with Himmler, but it's full okay. of these agricultural fantasies and they're smelling the soil and they're you know holding the the crumbs in there. Uh, in their in between their fingers yeah 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 and then in this moment you have you have alfredo who actually turns everything into this counter memory that can goes from from this non-soil you know yeah. which is actually a dirt and, and there was one other thing i would like to contribute and then i will shut up um, i just wanted if i can have the screen um and that is because uh I mentioned this whole problem of actually the barracks, uh, and uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, I'm, I, I stopped sharing. Um, okay, let's see if it works. So, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so I've been involved with this whole uh, research project on barrack huts. It's a history of the barrack hut. And one of the things that I uh, have done is actually make of every barrack hut a digital model. So here we have the Reichsarbeitsdienst Baracke, uh, which was developed in the mid 1930s in Germany and became a model for many of these, uh, these forced labor camps. And here we have the horse stable barrack, uh, which was the, uh, for, developed for the Wehrmacht in 1941. Uh, and, and the reason I asked uh, the people who were making these drawings, these were students, to always use the worm's eye perspective. Uh, so the Choisy, which uh, Auguste Choisy developed. And the reason for that was because the barrack is in some way, it comes from above. It is actually like, it doesn't actually touch the ground in a sense. I mean, our, you know, it doesn't really have permanent foundations. And this is when you said how these barracks were all removed. One of the reasons that all of these camps are empty is because all over Europe, these barracks were recycled to be housed for people who are bombed off their houses, you know, reconstruction of cities and so on. In the case of Auschwitz, there are no wooden barracks left except 11 that were returned at the end of the 40s because all the wooden barracks were brought to Warsaw where they were housing, um, housing uh, reconstruction groups of the city. And so for me, the issue of the absence of the barracks and how do you actually represent that absence the problem I have with uh, any attempt that, for example, you have in Auschwitz, where they reconstruct a, basically these very, very minimal foundations, is in some way for me problematic. And it's problematic because the barrack is essentially a building without foundations. Yeah. So I always have had that fantasy of the barrack that was suspended over the site. So in a very early project that I created in 19... 80, in 1991 for an exhibition space in Auschwitz, which I wanted to do in the Canada site, which is the site where the storage houses were. Actually, my, my idea was to create a big pit and to have the exhibition in that pit and to actually have the, uh, the barracks as skylights sitting over that pit, hanging over that pit. So this whole idea of this idea of this touching down of these barracks instead of them being held up was going to be represented at the site. I just wanted to, you know, I, I, I have struggled a lot with this whole problem of the, the present, the presentation and the representation of the absent barracks as buildings without foundations on these particular sites. 
yeah this is uh, yeah this is really interesting what you and what is what is somehow again you know this this mayor who is a guide in Mauthausen I mean you know he's like 40 years old or something like this uh, even younger at the time when we met uh, so he was saying actually that him guiding through Mauthausen actually when they don't have evidence where they don't have you know uh, objects, the imagination, you know, grows, of course, and he has much more, you know, uh, uh, relations also with the, with, with the relation, he built another kind of relationships with the, with the visitors uh, yeah. around this uh, non-presence, yeah. What I find very interesting in Mauthausen, because I, uh, I go often with groups, I travel with groups on, you know, on these Holocaust journeys, and I was like two years ago with a group in Mauthausen. I mean, we, this was, you know, a big journey. And we asked, we, I don't think it was your mayor. What was the name of your mayor again? Peter Stradner. Yeah, no, it was not him. And so, but the, we were there two days. So we asked basically the guy to give us exactly the, the standard tour. Because the, I was with teachers. And so the idea is how does the standard tool deal with the standard people, you know? Going through it, and so, uh, but we did a critical tour. That meant instead of having the standard tour for two hours, we did it over the whole day, and so we had continuously a discussion about what were the choices of what they show, what they don't show, what can be seen, what's not seen, what's made up in words, what actually is the forensic evidence of what's there. And I thought that right now the Mauthausen, the Mauthausen tour is absolutely superb. Absolutely, I think it's the best concentration camp tour. In the world, and that it, and, and and the reason is that they constantly deal with what could be seen by the people who lived around the camp and what could not be seen, what could be heard by the people around it, yeah. and it starts out with a soccer game, which was held there in February 1945. Yeah, where the soccer game, the stadium is right next to the worst part of the camp, and there's only barbed wire fence between. Yeah, yeah? and then. Who are the people coming in to watch the soccer game? Who was actually present at that soccer game? There were people from all over Austria. This was, you know, this was a big game being, being, being played there. And people from all over Austria were at that game. And they were right, you know, within 50 meters from the barbed wire fence. And there was no screening whatsoever. Yeah. I thought, I think it's what, what Mauthausen is doing is absolutely exemplary. Sorry to, uh, to, to weigh on. There's maybe not relevant information here, but I think it's important because of this non-presence, you know. Uh, and you have this. Sorry, sorry, Nick. I just just wanted to say what you have. You have this over over presence of these bodies that are underground, and this is you know they're not visible, but they're present, and this is like a such a strong, you know, um, situation and also conceptual framework for your, for your work, you know. And I think extremely thought, yeah, yeah, but I think this is, it's also very exciting, actually, this, this total present and invisibility, you know, this is uh, an impossibility to get there, you know, to, to, to see. Which is which is fantastic, actually, uh, and it, it brings another way of thinking about everything. So, yeah, you have a great work in front. I mean, this is so wonderful. I can, yeah, and this is yeah, great. <laughs> I, if I could just, uh, I just Milita, thank you for sharing. That was wonderful. Um, and I just, I had a question about the um, when you were saying. Um, yeah, about the soil as an archive and how certain types of uh, vegetation and animal life kind of thrives um, where human bodies are decaying or buried. Um, yeah, I'm just, could you say a little bit more about that? And I'm curious, you know, is it, um, is it a direct, it's, so it's a direct one-to-one, -one, it's a causal relationship that a decaying mass of human bodies will create, I think you mentioned wormwood, blue butterflies. Yeah, wormwood, but because wormwood grows on the places where where the soil is worn, and actually because of uh, of of of, of these uh, you know the bodies that are um, um, 
yeah, uh, so <laughs> that are uh, that are uh, uh, have a German word zerfallen. You know. buried there, no? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I have you. <laughs> You're like a great friend that can help. Uh, so, so that this actually produces this enormous energy, you know, that produces heat. And actually, out of this, you have then a special uh, ecosystem that is quite homogen. And you know, you have a wormwood, and then next to the wormwood, you have the blue butterflies that are coming, you know, in big, in masses, and they are actually. Uh, um, how you say they are attracted by the wormwood. So it's a whole ecosystem that is being built out of this, of these bodies that are under the, yeah. So because in, 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 in Srebrenica and also in Omeska, you cannot find this. And this is the, so there are a, a, a huge amount of unexcavated, you know, uh, 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 and they are, yeah, they are not marked, they are not uh, excavated, they are, they are not known also. Yeah. So, so this is a special uh, way how then nature, you know, deals with this and how these ecosystems that are being built actually out of this change and actually this traumatic uh, 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 moment that 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 is changing actually the the the, the crops the, the 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 growth of of mm -hmm. of that what is and and everything around this i mean there are much more examples but this is one example that is so you know there are insects that are you know attracted by mm -hmm. the warm wood that grows out of this site so yeah. the archaeologists they are they are just you know uh, like spotting this these places because in order to start excavation you need two witnesses and archaeologist who is working on this and then they have don't have these witnesses and they have to work on their own you know yeah because I, I believe as I understand it at, at Bab and Yar the bodies were actually exhumed shortly after they were initially buried and then the ravine itself has been kind of filled in over time so I don't think that we would have the same sort of um, botanical signature available, but I wonder if there's if there's a kind of symbolic dimension um, of you know, what happens to nature above uh, mass burials or sites of trauma that we might look for or look to create as a means of uh, memorializing. Because um, I'm also thinking like, you know, there, there's in, in nature in particular, there are certain species that just thrive on trauma on, on decaying matter like saprocytes and, and so on. Um, so yeah, I guess I was just curious if there is, um, yeah, what, what it would mean to deal with the, the vegetative or plant, yeah, the, the, the living, the living, um, the transformation of habitat that happens at sites of trauma um, that we might be able to use as a, as a language where we are, even if it's not there naturally. Absolutely. I mean, even even more, you know, this is because, as I said, for 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 this project, Avalanche Memorial, I do not care just what happened, you know, at the time of the concentration camp. I also do care what happened from that time till now, you know, because this is even more symptomatic and significant and this opens so many you know doors of understanding the place so you know what how you know like how 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 they dealt with this place you know this speaks about the society at the end and the whole society was built actually out of this we could say you know if you would radically now talk about this and my interest in Srebrenica was also because I think that the post-genocidal society in, in, in Yugoslavia is built on Srebrenica. So not, and we are this, this society, art, everything. So in order to, to live and to survive, actually one has to go straight into the soil, you know, and, and, and meet this. So for that reason, I think that this, this period between the, you know, uh, 
the, the, <laughs> between the atrocity and now, it's even more, you know, it's even more symptomatic, let's say. And this speaks then about the past and the present. And so this is the way from where we start thinking a memorial. Without this, you know, there is, we are just building something, you know, that, that, um, that has no relations actually to, it's actually about forgetting. And this is a beautiful quote of Branimir and I don't have this in front. It's actually kind of a screen, you know, in this sense, memorial or museum or whatever becomes a kind of a screen where trauma is actually, you know, being, being on the other side of the screen. And yeah, so, so, so at the end, you know, as he said, I think in this, that it actually these kind of memorials becomes the trauma itself. So this is the reason that all the memorials today and monuments are actually a place, place of struggle, you know. We realize this already, you know, working on with Grupa Spomenik on this Yugoslav situation, where actually it was so clear, you know, that memorials and monuments are not possible in the way they were before, you know. Uh, and actually they, they are just sites of, of, of you know, conflict. Mm -hmm. so, so in this way, to, 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 to see this as a continuation, you know, of the atrocity that happened in different ways. And this is so nice how you can read this in the soul. I don't know how much you can, you can go into this, uh, you know, you know, there, there are many, there are many, uh, aha, look, I have something to show you. So this is the carrot, it's called carrot, you know, carrot. And you put this in the ground and this is very, not so much, not so big, it's like this. So you put this in the ground and you take it out. And this is actually ideal for flotation. And flotation is a kind of a most beautiful, you know, uh, <laughs> like, um, like you open the door of things that are invisible, but you can interpret them, you can understand. You see this carrot, how this looks like. You go for it. This is like an archeological tool and also for gardening, I think, when they try to understand how to, how to build a garden out of what, la, la, la. And here actually in this, you have all these layers. It doesn't have to go deep, you know, but it is so small. So I don't know, you know, this is a question. It's a, it's a very, I don't know your situation and I don't know, you know, how much you can, you can touch this ground, probably not at all. And this is even better. I don't know. This is even more. Then there is something happening there, you know. There is something happening with the with the with the with the with the with the crops. There is something happening with the place, you know, analyzing everything. Who wants this? Who didn't want this? You know, how how this goes, whose properties, who was then, you know, all this stuff speak so much, you know, about the site, you know this better than me, but yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's, it's very complicated on this site, right? Because, um, I mean, I, just a couple, a couple of things worth mentioning. Um, you know, before World War II, there were no trees on site. So virtually every single tree that's, that's grown has, uh, has only come afterwards. Um, and yeah, I mean, so, you know, there, there's this question of- So what happened, sorry, with these trees? They were cut or? No, no, well, it, it's not 100% sure. I, I at least don't know. I mean, the, especially the area that was used for the murders, it was a sand quarry, mm -hmm. right? So there, 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 was no, there was no vegetation, but now when you go there, it's, uh, I, was at, I was just there this weekend. Um, it's, it's, it's a forest. It's, huh. it's a very, very like rich forest. And, and, you know, there are some old growth trees, but, you know, most of it's new. Um, but like beyond that, also this question of like, can we touch the ground? How much can we do? Um, that's one question for us, but at the same time, there's so much that has already happened to this site, right? One area in the, you know, in, in, in the, in the forest is used as a dirt bike track. 
mm -hmm. right? It's like a mountain bike track. Um, and you know, so there, there's there's all these kind of buildings that are built on top with and without foundations. Um, and so and so, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's also it's also a question of like, what do you do with the uh, what, what do you do with kind of the, the, the things that have already been done um, kind of afterwards to the ground, to the site? I think that's a really important question for us to, to reflect on. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of maybe what we're, what we're dealing with is also this kind of perspectival shift of just like, how do you understand the fact that, for example, none of these trees existed before, um, mm -hmm. or all of these things are built illegally, but also just, you know, in violating certain principles. Um, but but one one kind of interesting thing that I that I want to kind of share to the group, but I also kind of want to put on record um, is uh, the 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 foundation. And I learned this this weekend um, when I was there. The foundation uh, came across a person who, for an unknown period of time, um, has been serving as kind of like a citizen archaeologist of this site. Mm -hmm. um, he's been walking around with a metal detector. He's one of these guys, right? Who just goes around and picks up things that are beneath the soil. Um, and apparently he's amassed an enormous collection of things. Um, and, you know, my, my first, uh, you know, so when I, when, uh, Milita, when I saw your exhibition, um, I immediately thought of, of this guy who's kind of or not done um, the work at the same level of detail, not the same sort of like soil analysis and, and really looking kind of the, 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 the biological or biochemical makeup of this. Um, but you know, my, my, my first thinking when, when, when I heard this, and this was just when I was like, just in the office, uh, I, you know, just like, just get everything, get absolutely everything, because we don't know how much we can go into the ground. Um, and we don't know, and there's very little that currently exists. And so I think, you know, uh, yeah, it would just, it, it would just be kind of so amazing. And I think the potentials for, kind of a, a space for commemoration. I think, you know, what, one of the things that you, that, that really comes across in your project is, and maybe this, this is just my interpretation, but you're talking about interpretive archeology. span So I think that's fine. Um, is, you know, <laughs> that, that archeology span is in and of itself a form of commemoration and memorialization. Um, and, you know, so the question of like, what can archeologists do on the site is very unknown, but there are already these forms of like kind of micro archeology span or that um, that I think are incredibly important to um, to 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 understand really and to and to capture. Can I just can I just puncture your bal balloon of enthusiasm a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Uh, just just for the context, so many Holocaust-related sites, uh, but the sites where Jews have been murdered, actually have been uh, a target, if I may call it like that, of people with metal det det detectors. Mm -hmm. And they've been searching these sites, started in Treblinka already in late 1944. There's a whole book written on that in the case, the particular case of Treblinka. Also uh, in houses in which Jews lived and from which Jews were deported. Uh, uh, basically, when the local population knew Jews had lived there, quite often the houses were demolished. People went in with metal detectors. And this has to do with the assumption that Jews always carried gold. Yeah. So there is, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a very dark shadow to this practice of, of, of going as metal detectors over, over Holocaust-related sites of massacres. And so I think we should realize that as, you, as, you're, as you're dealing with this person, that might not be the case, probably it's not, but um, motivation uh, in many of these cases was not always, let's call it scientific. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that, that, that is a really good point. Um, maybe on um, map, in, in other places, though. So uh, um, it's in some other uh, spaces for mass graves. People does it to re try to retrieve items that belong to their relatives. But I understand that this is not the case. But I mean that that practice in different contexts also has different meanings. Now, I was just like sorry for joining late, but I was super fascinated what for what you said about the trees. Um, so I don't know, like in, in my first obviously uh, obvious thought is that there is a rich soil because of the, the composition of the bodies uh, at, at some point. Could be, there some, could be a, a way of reading it, obviously very direct, yeah. but yeah, I mean... Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's so direct, um, right? I mean, because a lot of the bodies were, were moved and also a lot of, some of them were burned. Um, but I think, you know, 
th this event did have certain other effects that allowed nature to grow, right? It, it, it stopped the mining activities that took place yeah. there. On and the also, river. This, this mudslide that took place in 1961, right? You know, the, mud is, is often very nutrient rich. Yeah, it's, it's actually like, uh, like Ruibal, uh, Christoph Ruibal says this is like, um, it's, it's very rich actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in this case, it was like brick waste, but still it was like this sludge. It was really, really kind of rich things. But, but so, but, you know, but regardless of whether it's like a direct or an indirect causality, right, it still is there, right, that, that you know, that this is kind of a form of, this is kind of how life has continued, actually. Yeah, but that. also connects with what uh, Robert Young was saying about the uh, Jewish uh, cemeteries that has the vegetation growing as well. So there is also this idea of this vegetation marking. I don't know. I like I like that maybe that the forest should be part part of the project, uh, but I haven't been there, so. So it definitely yeah, and another just thought about the fact that there have been other uh, ways in which that soil has been treated doesn't mean that because that already happened we want to position ourselves in the same way you know it's like oh because other people already did it we mm -hmm. can also do it or doesn't mean so I think it's, it's still any any action that that you do in that space has a meaning mm -hmm. and regardless if many other people has treated it differently. I think it still makes it still important to have a positionality, regardless uh, of you know. Absolutely. But there is you probably there is this book by by Didi Berman, this Borkin, mm. about his experience in Auschwitz, and him looking actually all the time beyond the fence beyond the fence looking at the at the nature actually and how this responds because he sees the site of, 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 of uh, Auschwitz as an extreme commodified place that actually counters memory you know uh, I mean counters the idea of, 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 of you know producing any kind of a connection with the place or or a history of the place. So for him, this is like a total negation of uh, of, of the of of uh, is a form of the memorialization. And then he's looking all the time beyond beyond the fence, looking at at Borken, you know, and the rim. I don't know uh, the, the 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 trees, the every, how this responds actually, and it's it's an maybe too poetic for my, you know, <laughs> for my uh, like feeling of, of that what one can read uh, about this, but actually very interesting if we read this also in different ways, you know, uh, talking about this wood, you know, that you have on the place of the, of the mass grave, actually. Uh, one, one of the things, of course, what happens in Birkenau, especially in Birkenau, is that actually the soil rotate? I mean, this constantly actually artifacts, fragments of bones, uh, especially from the public burnings that were in what they call the field of ashes, actually comes to the surface. Uh, it, it's remarkable. So there is this also this constant project actually of having to deal with that, uh, let that that human material, and to have regularly f uh, funerals. You know, there it's buried again in mm -hmm. the site and then it comes up again it's 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 really remarkable that 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 uh, that the earth does not allow these remains to rest there mm. and i like very much nick's comment about you know uh, archaeological site and excavation as a commemoration let's say if it's or as a as an act of you know um yeah, did you say commemoration, Nick? Yeah, memorial. Yeah, I mean memorialization. Memorialization. Yeah. Okay. There's a memorialization. So I have to think about uh, Rui Bal's example, which is for me one of the most interesting. So he was doing an excavation uh, like site uh, uh, for uh, actually in relation to the to the Spanish Civil War. And actually, they were excavating uh, a place uh, which was 
you know uh, like quite important for uh, for so so in the moment when they excavated the site uh, where actually the, the day when the civil war ended and when the fascist won over republicans it was raining it was a lot of rain so this place was full of bottles of celebration of franco's uh, army uh, of a fascist actually who were celebrating and it was full of water full of water from that time in the 30s and then there was also uh, a toilet nearby and i mean a toilet the place where they were you know um like going to the toilet and uh, in the moment when they were excavating and in the moment when they when they when when they took all the soil out of this place it was raining again so in this moment the whole fecal you know <laughs> content somehow went into the air as a smell so he said this was the smell of the fascists you know won over republicans that was actually happening on this side through this excavation. So why I'm talking about this, because this is also very much about this post-processual archaeology, the way how somebody who is like, because we could say he's a, like almost, I don't know, I think he's a communist, he never said this, but I, I imagine this. Uh, so that, that somehow, you know, this act of you know, excavation brings the truth of the event, you know, and at the same time, so, but it brings from your position, you know, from your interpretation. So also this smell as an, as an evidence, which is actually invisible, you know, and not, you cannot hold it and you cannot preserve it. It's maybe one of the best examples for me for this uh, reflective archeology. span and also in relation to this, that this can be a memorialization, you know, the, the excavation itself, because this smell is the best memorial actually for, for, this, for this site. There's actually a good, uh, there's a good location in the, in the, in the ghetto, in the Jewish uh, cemetery in Warsaw, which was used, uh, was part of the ghetto. It was the only green space in the ghetto. Uh, there is actually uh, an, 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 a point where actually the sewer that was used for people to escape and that piece of sewer is not connected anymore to the sewer, the current sewer system in Warsaw. But if you come close to that, if you come within 15, 20, 20 meters from that point, you're all, one way or another, there's this overwhelming sewer smell coming into the cemetery. Yeah. And it is very interesting for me, again, when you take people there, is that when you suddenly move from uh, what basically is a visuals and an auditory space, visual space, you're seeing stuff and auditory space is my explanations of what people are seeing. And suddenly the auditory, the, 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 the smell takes over. Yeah. Uh, and you're in a kind of Proustian, you're really in a kind of Proustian kind of moment of recognition. Uh, uh, it's it's absolutely amazing, and it's always one of those points in the trip that people really remember. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I thought also. Thank you so much, uh, Milica, for your presentation. Um, but I also uh, because we spoke about both the ecology on this place, but I think it also uh, uh, showed that everything is interconnected in some ways, right? The person who walks over that area might enjoy those butterflies, right? And might not actually necessarily look for, for the bodies, right? But still would be attracted to that site and would come again and again for a walk, right? And then there's the person with a metal detector now in Bobby. Yeah, but he might have some gloomy reason and uh, anti Semitic reason why he would look for that. But he's also existing in that space, right? Then you have these. these these trees that vertically, let's say, they speak about these different layers in, in the ground. Uh, but it's all about practices, right? It's all about kind of inhabiting this place and it's never quiet. It's never just fenced off and not touched. It's kind of like, and that's why I also, when we, we, uh, we began to speak actually about how to create a certain routine that is a memorial, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's also to, 
to be, let's say, to have little uh, different protagonists, if you want to name them, like in a theater place, right? There's the archaeologist, there's the scientist, there's the the filmmaker, there's the yeah, the interviewer, and and it's actually and it's not. It can be accidental, but at some point you might actually try to, like you have these fields, right? And uh, you took these squares from the ground, and you said, okay, I take this square, but at the same time there was another one next door, right? So you were actually creating several patches in which you try out basically sections or let's say you frame certain situations. So and I think this could be something that is also uh, might be interesting for the whole site, right? So there's kind of different kind of uh, moments in which you read them all, right? Some gentler, let's say more on the surface, others, uh, let's say deeper, where you cannot do it over the whole place, but you just you really you also, let's say, even if you cannot touch the ground, maybe you go into that conflict, right, and see what happens, right. So let's say there is like a one uh, square meter <laughs> hole, yeah, um, and you risk it, you risk the kind of, <laughs> so it's just about like to understand this whole thing as a kind of, uh, yeah, in their potentiality. And this is why I like also the, in a way, I mean, it, it, I think that's also where Nick was asking you, so what happened? Like, <laughs> was there actually like housing built around that place or even on top of it, which sounds horrible because it would kind of undermine completely or kind of ignore the story. I was just uh, uh, kind of embellishing the, that there's something continuously wrong and uh, sort of to be worked around uh, going on. So I, when you put the earth into an enclosure, right, you would think it should also go back, right? <laughs> and then you take something else out and you basically always shift grounds around. So this kind of choreography yeah, where you- Yeah, yeah, this is true, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. But I, yeah. But so I what happened? There was housing now on top or what, what happened? What was still, the story? Still, still not, but they were selling this then. Terrible. And, you know, changed property and, uh, so, but this is the site of this of this other part that was actually with Graz workers mm. and later with forced laborers that has actually also to become a site of, of memorialization. Uh, but it is it is actually part of you know Austrian life, you know. But what what I think, you know, uh, it is all these decisions, you know. So should one put the hands into the into the soil, or shall we, you know, uh, not touch anything? You know, this these are also, or can we take this uh, soil and what do we do with this? Uh, for for this reason, I think this this is a kind of a very important, let's say, decision that is part of this, uh, let's say, reflexive archaeology. Which, which, which talks then very much about your attitude and your political also in- How uh, much you dare to do, do. yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. What you do. So for me, it was crucial actually to bring to Graz where you have 42 labor camps and no memorial. Now they have in one like Libanon, they're speaking about this, but this is recently discovered, you know, mm -hmm. while I was here this was discovered that there are 42 labor camps. And, and actually for me, it was important to bring this soil to Graz, you know, because this is such an important moment because the whole Stadt Dammler Puch that still exists in Graz, you know, in different form, that, that they're calling themselves, you know, children of war. So this is, you mm -hmm. know, and the whole, the whole habitus, you know, of the, of the in of the uh, citizens, you know, uh, to 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 bring this soil as a part of Graz. Actually, this was for me an act, and actually not bring it back to Afland, mm -hmm. but leave it there. Mm -hmm. You know, this is an this is like a conceptual act, like uh, mm -hmm. let's say, and the kind of you know this soil will be there still, and it is now part of one you know they didn't do anything out of this and there was no possibility to do anything but this will exist somewhere but i like very much this idea of of this one can say choreography but it isn't it is actually a place that is a living place you know 
and that you just capture this moment. And mm -hmm. then it, what is wonderful actually for you to decide what to capture and why, because there are billions of things. And again, this post processual archaeology always looks, you know, at particular ways how to deal with things because you can develop this endlessly, you know, how things are. So there are cuts that are, I think, like political decisions of, of, of transformation of you, you, you as a group being involved there on the site and the people who invited you and the, out, the future audience as well. Mm -hmm. So this, this is everything actually, your decisions, you know, and your transformation during this trip, <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say that, um, yeah, it's a very good question. And uh, well, thank you for everything. And uh, it's a pleasure. And I think we should uh, probably keep going this conversation longer. And we have uh, actually started research of the territory from the very, very basic uh, naturalistic approach. So like having uh, people to learn what are the soils, what is the water over there, what are the trees and stuff like that and we're gonna to do it next year and we want to also include archaeologists to this uh, process so I think it uh, can be very good to uh, find the correct archaeologists that uh, yeah um, and one of the first ideas we had about the museum itself like at the point when we enter this project having in mind that we have to build the museum um, I mean, having the idea of uh, kind of a single building, we now we're thinking more rather uh, for the territory, having many, many kind of points of entrances to the story. Yeah, so we had this idea to build a museum from the earth in a way that it's, you know, so then you understand why do you have this earth and then the, the body of the, uh, this monument of the, of the place is, uh, yeah, you, you know what it comes from. So it's like very mm -hmm. organic growing from the area in a way. And uh, yeah, so we have on the one side, this idea of kind of minimal penetrating the earth, but on the other hand, if you, if you do penetrate, then it should be like very strong thing. Why do you do this? And then, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you would you would make this out of out, you the idea was to make this out of the same earth of the same soil. Yeah, it wasn't a kind of you know ideal uh, ideal idea, but we know that it might be very complicated in but terms. It's, of, it's interesting uh, because many times when you have to build something, you excavate, and that sand, that soil, is not used in the construction of the building, but is it maybe used in the construction of another building because you know, all these soils are recycled and the construction industry is always in search of sand and soil to make. So I think for me, maybe it's too metaphorical or rhetorical, but um, it's interesting also to think, and that's what I was showing like the ensemble studio thing, which is not exactly the same, but something when you excavate and what you put up, uh, up is somehow related. So maybe it doesn't have to be everything, but maybe as a, it's, it's not impossible. I think maybe we look back in many ways in which uh, architecture has been developed over, you know, centuries. Probably the the sand or the soil used for the excavation was also used for the direction of the architecture. It's just now that we don't do it that way. But. Uh, just just to to throw in, uh, there's a Jewish tradition that you actually get buried in the soil of the Holy Land, so in exile. That means that there's always a little bit of soil from Israel uh, mm. thrown in your grave, uh, which is an interesting one. Uh, the other one is just want to note that the National Memorial in the Netherlands that was uh, uh, dedicated in 1955, actually at the back of it, uh, it has places for the soil of all of the major sites where Dutch people were murdered. Uh, so they brought soil from Auschwitz and Dachau and whatever like that. And so it's, it's part of the memorial. Where is that? It's in Amsterdam. Yeah. Yeah. The one on the dam, the big one. Oh wow. The, the, the big, the big, the big, the big, the big needle. And how they store the sand? It's like in uh, in glass. Uh, 
how they store the sand. Uh, it's it's I don't know how they it's it's it at the back of the thing. It's they they put it in the back, so it, it's part of the it's part of the memorial. But it's also maybe it's it's symbolic, I imagine, right? Where yeah, it's all symbolic, of course. Soldier type but thing. there's a lot of traffic of soil of of uh, related to to either few, uh, to either sites of massacre or uh, I mean traditionally or to cemeteries, uh, you know, from place to place. Um, that probably would make an interesting presentation down the road. Yeah, I mean, I, I I really like the kind of performative dimension of this, right? Because one of one of the one original idea that uh, I mean was thrown around in one of my first meetings um, with the foundation was, yeah, like what if actually everyone kind of like has a shovel and like digs the ground, right? But kind of the reverse of that is like, what if there's a space and it's encouraged for people to just bring earth to the site, right? That that you know we could bring almost... the earth from somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, I okay, mean, so hmm, this what, what, what kind of contribution would have, yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea, but I'm just thinking of like of of you know, I was just kind of thinking further about this idea of you know, like the Dom Square, right? Where there's this idea of kind of mixing soils of where you are buried and where you are from or where you belong. Um, so that there should be a space for, you know, that there should almost like be a platform for people to bring soil. Uh, can I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm just got an answer to Marina's question. So on the pylon at the back, there is this wall and there are 12 urns in the wall. Uh, they've been, uh, they are filled with earth, I was wrong, of uh, places of execution in the Netherlands from the 11 provinces mm -hmm. and 22 and 22 places of execution in the Dutch East Indies where the Dutch also were occupied. Uh, and there is a text attached to it. It says, Earth, a sacrifice, uh, it, it was uh, dedicated by sacrifice, brought together from the whole country, a sign into the far future of, uh, of remembrance and our, uh, and our, uh, our uh, solidarity. Yeah, because I was thinking also what, that, that I showed the other day also that um, the museum in the US that brings the soils where the lynching happened as well, not as marking also that connection to the land. But maybe in, in like another, I'm, I'm just going back to my point, but I'm not sure. I mean, either it was clear, I just want to say it again, was there was something when I looked at the images um, uh, of your archaeological site, Milica, um, there is something also awkward for people who live there that somebody is digging there, right? It's something you pass by, yeah? You walk your dog, you, you actually, you were used to see the butterflies and uh, all of a sudden this, this uh, scene is happening, right? Mm -hmm. But also uh, there's something, it's awkward and maybe you, you, you understand its awkwardness, right? And I think this is the, uh, the beauty of the whole piece that it's, it's not necessarily alone uh, a piece of archeology span and trying to find the history, but it has that performativity built in. So it's not about finding out and getting this piece, this, uh, yeah, the, this site at rest. But you might come next year with something else. You start planting something, or yeah. So, but that this richness exactly. of making exactly. awkward, awkward actions on the site, right? So it's not about yeah. making, uh, you know, happy, happy. But they're like, let's say the traffic goes the different way around, or it's stopped at all, right? At certain points. So there's always something because you bring in a new machine in, and the kind of the residents nearby think, oh my God, what again now happens, right? <laughs> again on that site. But they were actually those who have being so close all right uh, i mean obviously it's 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 what you carry when you live there right it's um, uh, probably yeah. that has to do more maybe with uh, what you were saying about that we don't need monuments yeah no they were designed before no that the, maybe the new monuments are is more infrastructural like you can feel experiences or well, let's say you would ha you would manage to speak to the mayor and ask for certain certain new routines, whatever to rub uh, to collect the rubbish on the site mm -hmm. uh, more regularly, right? <laughs> so that means you have to explain that to different authorities, right? And just to shift it away from that image, always that uh, like that is the memorial. It's just that maybe when when you are getting closer, you realize 
really strange things are happening. Right? You're totally, it's, it's very close to, 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 to my understanding actually, because what you're saying, you know, um, different people coming there doing different, it's not just, you know, it is not, all, it is awkward, I don't know, but it is actually somebody wants to know. Yeah, something yeah. about this and I think mm -hmm. this is crucial for the people around this was the main the main idea around four faces of Omarska that we are constantly coming there without so the idea was not to have the memorial but to constantly be there and to learn about the space in order to understand you know how how uh, to, to understand actually how, how the whole, in, for us, uh, how the world works actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's it. yeah, yeah. such a complex thing that actually could be anywhere, you know. Uh, so in this sense that you have a continuous um, drive of people mm -hmm. coming, you know, and doing things, as you said. Yeah. And this is really interesting because it has nothing to do with the theater, actually. It is, it is about, you know, learning through the trauma, you know, through a traumatic, you know, troubled uh, side. Yeah, maybe yeah. another term for, uh, could be that, to think of it as an intergenerational uh, project, no? I mean, that of course. you're going there, let's say, and we, we just have it embedded that there are certain groups that always come, right? There's always a university that comes to this place and or like does some, you know, makes it a project and that's handed over to the next. And there's certain kind of repetitive uh, modi modi developed, right? But you pass it on in a way. So rather than buildings and things that uh, <laughs> a building has to... How do you see architecture in this? I mean, do you do you look at this as an you know, in this way or not at all when you talk about this? Yeah, I was just like when I I was just like, my last sentence was uh, I wanted to say that actually in order to facilitate all that, right, you need to kind of a bureau <laughs> or reception desk or <laughs> um, sort of the. The place in which you understand the yeah let's say the the office <laughs> the bureau mm -hmm. um, no, that's where our dangerous <laughs> <laughs> always <laughs> yeah but yeah this is it's it's really interesting uh, uh, what you're suggesting because actually this has this uh, you know intense uh i mean intense doesn't have to be in this way but in a, a continuous you know uh relation to the site that doesn't exist you know uh through a museum and things that will happen there or whatever you know that you will have a library and the archive and this and that you know hmm. yeah yeah i mean i think that 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 is really kind of the the question that we all have right um and uh and and yeah you know i think that uh, maybe maybe it's also just a way to kind of um, to, to kind of update others as to kind of what's going on outside of this kind of weekly space. Um, I think that this is also a question that we need to ask the architects um, because they might uh, they might kind of understand the agency of form um, in kind of ways that we might not be able to think of. Ma, you have to say bye to the architects and just you work on this. I mean, on the whole. Thing. <laughs> because I don't see. Because any, there is no solution for this, you know, in this sense that, you know, uh, it has to, it has to, at the same as, uh, you know, nature or crops, it has to grow out of constellations that you discovered through this. And, you know, <laughs> you you should be the architect, you know, your group. Yeah, we definitely need more um, artists uh, among architects. <laughs> Actually, we had a plan today uh, with Nick today uh, to talk about more the uh, how things are going. I'm not sure if you have enough time today. No, I will leave you here. 
I'm really, it was really, for me, really nice to, to talk to you and very inspiring, I have to say. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Melissa. And hey, maybe, maybe you'd be willing to, uh, to join us again sometime. Yeah, when you have some, <laughs> some, some interesting presentation or when you, I don't know, just call me. I will, I will be very interested, actually. Nick, I have to say, I didn't have so much time to look at the documents because I got it on a very short, <laughs> didn't have so much time. And I'm really sorry because I really wanted to go deeply into this. Uh, so well, then, I will now have time to look at this, and and yeah. and yes, I would I would be happy. No, so let, let's just stay in touch with this. I think a lot of the archaeologists who you've been working with or who you've been referencing, I think, are very valuable for this, and so we might be reaching out to them in the future. Um, and in that case, you know, we'll absolutely get back in touch. Yeah, and actually, I think that uh, we're gonna reach you probably soon. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, let's sneak together. Yeah. 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 No, Right. Okay, have a great time. And Robert, please send me this 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 uh, like a reference or a book that you that you that you were that you I were just that I already did so. And you, I already did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ro Robert, I also included so I also included an article I wrote, uh, which is actually about memorials in urban settings when oh. you don't dig. So that is the idea was, it's exactly the counter proposal, uh, some Dutch practices, so. Okay. Okay, I need also to leave if that's. Uh... Ines, bye. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. bye, Robert. Bye, Anna. Bye, bye. 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 Yeah, I don't see everybody, uh, but I, yeah. Right. Um, but Robert Young, can you stay for just a quick second? Two, uh, uh, two minutes. Yes, two minutes, that's fine. Um, no, just say bye. 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 Um, I can't be here next week. Um, so I, I have the final reviews at the refilled. Um, so I would greatly appreciate it if we could try and find another time to meet next week um, instead of kind of our, our usual spot. It's been kind of Maybe amazing. we can uh, try this week if it uh, will work for everyone okay now thursday and friday i'm totally uh, at this moment totally unavailable yeah. uh for a rather painful reason so uh <laughs> i'll i'll just i'll send out a, a a way how you can just kind of mark your availabilities over the next yeah. let's say two weeks yeah, yeah okay next week for me is okay yeah okay. but next week i'm also fine okay yeah nice. Nice. all right okay bye-bye thank you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. bye. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if everyone else can stay, that might be might be. I can good. stay, yeah. Yeah. Ah, cool. Um, yeah. So I mean, I, I think it's just important to update uh, up to make sure that we're all on the same page and just to kind of give some updates as to what's going on in the project as a whole. Um, as uh, I mentioned, um, I went to Kiev last weekend, or this weekend. I got back yesterday. Uh, I have to say, it was a very transformative experience just seeing this place. Um, seeing how much of a place it was, how much it's not an idea, it's a, it's a very real place. Um, I think that that was really important. Um, and you know, one of, the, one of the main reasons why I, I went and it was a very last minute decision. Um, and you know, Anna was an incredible host. Um, uh, but you know, it's because um, I've started, uh, as I mentioned, I've started uh, getting in touch with certain architects to solicit uh, conceptual sketches and ideas for um, what ways to, let's say, formally and materially intervene in the site. Um, the, I, I, I don't think that uh, not doing anything or doing something purely immaterial is, is an option. Um, the, this, this site, it's a very, as I said, it's a very material place. It's something, it's a place that has had things happen to it. Um, over the past, you know, thousand years, and I think it would be, um, uh, it, it, it would it would be doing a certain disservice to the site to have absolutely nothing done. Um, so, you know, th these are very just kind of exploratory conversations that I'm having, um, and they are for the purpose of kind of uh, getting Ilya material so that he can present to um, the the supervisory board. Um, the supervisory board presentation, which was originally scheduled for one week today, week from today, is now in January. Um, it's mid-January. 
so you know, I'm 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 reaching out to a number of different architects and just trying to start conversations and to see you know what sorts of ideas they might have. Um, some I'm engaging more specifically, right? There, this this abandoned psychiatric hospital. This, this it was never finished even. It's absolutely enormous. It's huge. It, you could probably fit everything the foundation will ever do in that one building. Um, but you know, so I'm like I'm I'm speaking with uh, Jan de Wilder and Inga Vick uh, about like maybe to find like an architectural language for intervening in in this building. Um, but you know, I also had a conversation like with Florian Idenberg from from Soil today to to talk about uh, boundaries and thresholds, right? Like how how do you how do you maybe begin to articulate um, you know the 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 threshold between a space that is is was a former graveyard and a form and and not a former graveyard, or where there was a ravine and where there isn't anymore, um, and you know so uh, similarly uh, there uh, I, I'm also going to be speaking with uh, Smilian Radic on Thursday uh, to speak about questions of navigation. Right, this is a very big site, and it's very easy to get lost. Um, and so, there's a question of like, how do we begin to to create moments of orientation and and, uh, and navigation within the site? How do you position the body within uh, within it? Um, also, uh, going to be speaking with landscape architect Gunter Vogt uh, on um, Thursday as well about uh, kind of devising landscape strategies, etc. Um, so, I mean the the. the I mean, we're we're really just kind of starting dialogues, but I think it's important to to mention this to everyone um, uh, because you know this isn't this also isn't something that that you know I or we want to be doing completely in isolation. Um, you know, this this should be a a wider conversation. It should be a wider dialogue as well. Um, but you know, we we do think that it's uh, so, so we at the foundation we think it's important to solicit proposals, right? Um, like material that can be that can be visually represented um and that can also that can that can let's say more tangibly communicate um certain ideas that 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 we have been having and also uh ideas that that we may not we may not know of yet but also might be really good who knows um i, I think it's I, I'm, hmm? I find this I, I, as we are very honest with each other i find a bit uh, uncomfortable with this because in a way I thought that we were also working towards having certain feedback for, for possible architectural firms. And now you are soliciting ideas for architects. In, and I don't know actually what type of conversations you are having with those architects. And I found that our role suddenly is a bit like uh, makeup. I kind of, I, I don't see how this group and the conversations we are having are actually connected to the conversations that you're having with the architects. And I, I don't feel, I, I, I'm, I don't know, <laughs> I, I, it's not what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. I know there is rush, uh, certain rush to have something done, but at this point, I think uh, this puts me in a position in which I don't see my, uh, my continuation in the project because it's going in a direction that I, I wasn't expecting it will go. And I, it's, it's again, I respect it, and I think it would be great to have this conversation with the architects, but then I don't understand what is the role of this group. I mean, what the role of this group is, I think, is is what we need to discuss. Um, but you, you, I have already ha have appointed or like uh, having conversations with people without we actually having any uh, actually a, a draft of our recommendation or something. Yeah, I mean. You know, not, none of this is is final, um, of course. But you know, I I think you know it was it was at the foundation found itself at a point where it needed ideas, um, it needed proposals, it needed images, um, and it needed it not just kind of references, but it needed like potential proposals. Okay, then I understand, but then I don't think I find myself. Uh, I find that I find that my presence is helpful because uh, we also share many ideas here, but if I don't see that they have any agency and they what they immediately, what they need is actually architectural proposals. I think we have been talking about architecture as well. I very much enjoy talking with everyone, but um, 
then I can or we can organize a reading group, uh, you know, about these sites. But I don't think I should have a role anymore um, because it's, it's an effort for me and for everyone. But if I see that it's just rhetoric, I, I, I think it's a waste of money for you and uh, time for me. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the things that we are discussing here are not just pure rhetoric. It's not it's not just for show. Um, I think that, you know, that this was evident, you know, with the fact that, you know, Manuel is now building a synagogue. Um, and these ideas came directly from this group. Um, this I the, the, the concepts that, um, you know, to kind of have different layers, right, to, to this kind of like Baroque approach of like adding more and more kind of different um, different layers. That this this is also something that kind of came from came from here. Uh, you know that. You know what what the the relationship between this group and the foundation as a whole is something that uh, we we tried discussing. Um, you know, for a number of months before we started doing these presentations, um, and it wasn't able to, like, we, we weren't able to kind of uh, define an organizational structure. Um, also, because, you know, th this would require kind of creating, you know, understanding the relationship to, to the, a much wider whole. Um, you know, I think we are now in a position where we can start to understand, like, well, I mean, just first of all, like, what are we? Are we a working group or are we a board? Right. If 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 we are a board, it, it means maybe you know that we given we're we're given a certain sense of like agency and authority, you know, to like give thumbs up or thumbs down um, over like architecture or 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 whatever. If it's a working group, um, it's it's more a space for the production of ideas. Um, and you know, I so there 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 have been you know so. Th this this has been a space also where you know other things have kind of you know spurned out right I mean right now like uh, Robert Jan is making a book right out of this out of, out of uh, you know his narrative um, in collaboration with Manuel about you know about the synagogue um, similarly and I, I hope this is okay I mean Troy is also doing a, 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 a research um, kind of departing from the presentation that he gave on uh, like these cosmological principles and, and, and kind of asking what that might mean for, for Bob and Yar. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that the, 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 the role of this group and at the very least what we have been doing over the past five weeks or six weeks now um, of kind of having these kind of weekly, not just weekly meetings, but also weekly presentations, um, I think that has been um, something that has not been just completely to the side, but it has been semi-autonomous from the the overarching or the the, the other activities of the of the um, you know of, of the foundation and you know the the question that has been kind of going. So we we've been given a certain degree of autonomy um, to produce a program uh, and and to share and to work with certain ideas. Um, that we feel are, are important to this project. Um, at the same time, there has been a number of times where the question has been asked, how can we help, right? Like what can we actually do more tangibly to, to feed into the, um, you know, to, to, to the foundation as a whole? Um, and, you know, I think that this, this has started uh, materializing in these kind of like very fragmentary um, and let's say non uh, non collective ways as well, um, but you know that's why they're they're you know if if and you know I mean I think that this board will continue. I mean Marina, if you feel like you uh, do not want to continue participating, of course that is your choice and that will be respected. Um, but you know that we we do need to establish certain ground rules, right? And and one thing that I would um, that I would propose is to, to run this almost like a group therapy session, right? Where anything that happens outside of the group that pertains to the foundation needs to be brought back into the group. Because for a number of weeks, there has been too much going on outside that has been, that we have not been able to, um, to, to fit. 
because we, you know, we've been given, or I, you know, I, I've been given this mandate to organize a certain set of workshops. That's what we've been having over these past number of weeks. Those, that only gives us time to discuss. It does not give us time to reflect. It does not give us time to really like regroup um, and to understand also like how these ideas that we are generating are feeding back into, in, into the foundation um, and how that is spurning off different projects. Um, and so I, I, I really do, uh, I, I at least agree that like, that the, the, the understanding of this group and what it does, what it's for, what its rules, what its responsibilities what its agency is that needs to be clarified at this point, because it's it's not clear. But I but so I don't know I I I I'm I'm not surprised that you have this response because this um, yeah but I mean it's not uh, is is I I respect what you have to do and it's not a confrontation it's just like I I also have many commitments and I want to make sure that the ways in which I'm engaged that, you know, my health is very limited, makes sense. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, so it's, it's just like a general approach to my um, my work commitments that I have to make sure that, that it's like where I am, I am needed, or at least I can make uh, something, I can have a, a, a it can be many, meaningful in some way because I am I'm, I'm not in the position to to do things if that's not the case. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I'm struggling every week <laughs> to not to, to to arrive to Friday and then I stay like uh, sleeping most of the week and so really and, and yeah I feel a bit uncomfortable with the different paces in which the foundation is going ahead and and the beautiful like conversations we are having but then makes me a bit uncomfortable to not understand what is the position, but it's not out. I mean, I totally respect you and Anna's work, and my whatever decision I take is not connected to the way in which you have treated us. Yeah, no, I I understand, and I mean, I I I do. Uh, I, I also appreciate you know you you sharing so honestly. This I think it's important. But maybe also to do this uh, justice to, uh, we had actually at the very beginning, we had two, three sessions actually thinking what we are doing, and where, how do we actually advise on anything? And so is, I mean, I, then we shifted to workshops, which, uh, which was interesting and fascinating. So it trained us as a group, right? And it became for us a kind of something where you and now Marina said, we trust each other now, no? And one can just say it. So it's nice. So we feel more, let's say it's kind of, it became my uh, calendar entry on Monday, even if I always run late, but it's, I know I should be here <laughs> by four o'clock. Right? Um, and I just also would like to know, uh, like whether we continue with that right and and i hope marina stays on um that uh, we are actually we create that kind of talk space <laughs> and uh, regularity where Ilya sometimes joins or yeah but we kind of we have these workshops and they could be more more off off let's say uh, uh, published um but we should maybe integrate much more of, let's say, these actions or these ideas, no? Because we, we, I think every time maybe it, it was the time management, but we, rather, we never had the time to talk actually about the idea back about Babia. So we, it was a bit sidelined now through all other kind of conversations or activities. So I also, the synagogue was fast. So I mean, I, I made also the connection to. Uh, to uh, Manuel, so uh, I'm happy with that. And I, I can, I sort of also, but I needed that moment to understand that is now it's it's happening. And I feel it should have come or at least should have been maybe more formally discussed uh, in in our little circle, because otherwise if this is sidelined, we feel like, oh, wh what is that? And so I can also understand that, um, Maybe we need to uh, go back to formalizing what that is, if there is a continuity. Otherwise, it's maybe, I don't know, we could just uh, continue with a few. But it would be nice to say there are more workshops and it becomes more and more public at some point. I'll just say from throwing mm -hmm. my two cents in, and Marina, I appreciate you bringing this up. 
Um, I, honestly, I've, I've been just, you know, in the last few weeks, I think thinking of myself as like a consultant, that's kind of it. Because when the synagogue of Manuel, first of all, like, I thought I was on an architecture advisory board and then an architect was selected to build architecture and it was designed and then it was presented to me um, without really much opportunity to weigh in in a material way. Um, it, that didn't feel like participation in a board or even being an advisory. Um, but then other opportunities have sprung up. I, I like the project. I like the people involved. I understand there's a kind of like um, endless urgency. Everyone's on a treadmill. Everything's changing all the time. People are like <laughs> struggling to do things. And then whenever there's a presentation, it's just like this explosion of work has been done. And the question I've been asking myself is like, do I want to be part of an explosion of work? Or, um, or, or am I more committed to the thing I thought I signed up for, which is not exactly, I don't think what this is anymore. And I'm, I'm willing to do the kind of treadmill, at least for a little bit. I think that the opportunity I've been given in the last couple of weeks to pursue things that are of my interest and of my expertise um, that are kind of uniquely applicable here and not very many other places um, for me is motivation enough to continue and to put a lot of effort into it. Um, but really for me, the mindset, if, you know, and, and Nick and I, you know, and again, like, you know, side conversations or like Nick and I are working on another project, we have a phone call on a Saturday and he's like, hey, by the way, blah, 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 I might be talking to architects. And I'm like, yeah, cool. If you need help, I can email someone or whatever. But then, um, you know, if, if I was just on an architecture board and it was like, hey, we just invited a bunch of architects, these are their names, I, I'd probably be feeling like, wait a minute, I thought I was part of the conversation about who those are and how to go about talking to them. Um, but just to give some, yeah, some feedback, I, I trust Nick, I trust Anna. I know they're under kind of like incredible pressure to do things, um, but I, I, I would have a different reaction to this if I had a different mindset and my mindset's already changed. I, I really think of myself as a consultant. So like, um, and that's why I'm gonna like play hardball on contracts. But in a way, like a consultant, that's okay. But a consultant to what exactly, or to whom? Because I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. We're a consultant to Nick and Anna. We are a consultant to Ilya. It, it, I, I, I'm still, a bit, I'm a bit unclear about that. Well, I, I'm speaking my my case in particular, and that was specifically that Ilya asked me to pursue the the kind of sacred architectural dimension and come up with a sort of sketch master plan of some sort, right? And so for me, that that's the that's the crux of how I see myself contributing to the project right now. Joining these meetings, perhaps bringing other people to the conversation as as time goes on. Um, but yeah, I, I get the same sense that like. Um, I don't see the causal link between the conversations we're having here and the things that are actually getting developed by the organization. I, am, I see that there's other people that are working around the clock, not just every you know Monday at 4 p.m. or whatever, um, to make things happen. And so I, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll to say like I'm taking a very loose view on what it means to be part of a board because I'm really thinking of myself as sort of like a hired gun in this case. And from in my case, I see myself. What I've been tasked to do is provide something that Ilya can use in a presentation in, in now, I guess, a month. Okay. No, it was very helpful to hear from you. But in my case, I didn't even have a meeting with Ilya. Yeah. Um, we were a VC, but also he has been VC. So I guess that my point of view is not of interest to him. So maybe, you know, that mm -hmm. our conversation couldn't, you know. <laughs> yeah, I have a very kind of also different approach to what I understand by architecture. Mm -hmm. Marina, I'm sorry, but we contact you to to have a meeting between you and Ilya for you know for several times. And, yeah, and you know, I responded, and then um, for instance with Valeria, I give uh, like possible dates, and it was never get back to me. Okay, I should check it. But uh, I had a feeling that uh, yeah, I I understand that uh, it's it's very rushed and it's hard to put it all together that everyone you know really understands what is going on. Um, and I, you know, Nick came here, uh, saw the site and understood that like, even though I was sending uh, lots of materials, it's still very complicated to get what is a site because it's huge. And it's also very complicated to get what we are doing because we are doing like we are 67 people around, yeah? And all of us work and it's without the amount of people who work for us outside like uh, the um, S, 
CST that uh, Rahmanika is doing the, the project with 3D model. So we are like, we having really massive production and it's really not enough time, those two hours. Yeah, so this uh, brought in some moment became uh, rather as a, uh, you know, br brainstorming, bringing new ideas uh, through those workshops. And I had feeling that next stage, so like as soon we kind of finished with our workshops, we can go into discussion of the materials for the, um, for the for the for the things that going to uh, consist that concept gonna consist. Yeah, so it's uh, we we are thinking uh, about the concept in a way as layers. So we don't make anything holistic right now from the point of view um, all the ideas, but layers, and then we will see how to like how it works. So at the moment, we, in a way, also bit in a position like we don't know what we'll get. Like we are commissioning uh, some people. We do it through, like Nick, Nick is commissioning some amount of people there. You know, the Troy is commissioning some people in terms of his thing. Then uh, we have two more uh, exhibition designers. Then we have internal team who work on the question, what is archive? What is a... Uh, education and it's like it's like you know it's a huge thing we're going to produce probably 800 pages for the concept you know it's like it's it's kind of thing that we i think that we can find a format for our discussion uh but it's like it requires some kind of time um that we all have to find and be ready for this kind of conversations. Sorry, I just need to go. I'm, and it's really a shame that it's rushed again, this kind of really important conversation. So can we plan this maybe for uh, whatever our next uh, session? Because anyway, Nikki, you were, you had it actually on the plan. We, <laughs> we just got carried away by Militz's. Uh, no, yeah. but so, so the, this, this is the end of the workshops for now. Um, so, you know, next week or whenever we next find a, a time, you know, there, there's nobody planned to come in or to give a presentation. We just, we just need to talk. But how do you imagine then, uh, because also the contracts that you sent were somehow until December. So is that the idea that we end in December or if not, what would be the idea of continuation for you? How do you see the role of the, um, from like 221? I think we should discuss it. Yeah, I, I also, I also don't know who has the agency to decide that. From the uh, Ilya side, I know that he's interested to to have uh, those kind of conversations for longer. But uh, the, the format of that yeah. and the the agency and stuff like that should be somehow discussed uh, together. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have an answer right now for this. Uh, unfortunately, we have to talk about this. And since we are so busy with uh, this concept, uh, it's simply not enough time to talk about this right now. But I hope I, he is uh, arriving today and I, I hope I can talk. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but but I mean, it is there, there is still a part of me that hopes that we can kind of uh, still have this plan that we spoke about, you know, before we started doing these workshops, right, where basically, um, you know, this becomes kind of an open, an open seminar room, basically. And, you know, every week we invite a new guest. I think this was really like a test run. Um, and, you know, people can curate different series. We can invite new people to bring in different audiences um, and different guests. Um, I mean, this is something that, that I, that, that I would really, really love. And I feel like it's incredibly important for the foundation. Um, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I think since we are going to really build next year so many things, like we, we're gonna do kind of partial navigation system, we're gonna like really have huge production and we would need like, you know, this discussion, what we do, how we do, like, it's really a pity that there was no possibility for like really to uh, invite uh, different architects uh, like and discuss them and so on. But I think it's still in a way, I think what we can do 
uh, next year, next time, and time after that. And by the December, we're gonna have several discussions. Sorry, yeah, did maybe... interrupt you, Nick, uh, or no? Hmm? Sorry, did what? I interrupt you, Nick? I'm sorry. No, but uh, but I just think it's important um, also to 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 think about the position that these discussions have, right? Because you know you're saying, or and I mean you said that like uh, you know. If, if we were to do this next year, we wouldn't necessarily invite more architects than we already have, right? I mean, so I think the architects, right? I mean, I would count as <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so it's in just, that sense, it's obviously we are. We, I'm an architect as well. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, but uh, I thought this was the idea, right? Yeah. No, but so then it's it's really a question of kind of making clear what relationship the, the the conversations that we have have to uh you know to everything else you know i think so i think i i sorry i'm i'm tired and i really have to take decisions about when and how i get involved and it took me a bit of uh off <laughs> but i think for me it's it's important to clarify for the for us and for the outside and the foundation, what is our role and what are the conversations? If you tell me that we are a public discussion series is one thing, but that 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 then the, the conversations that we have are not necessarily leading to any kind of advice or anything like, but I, I would like to, um, I, I would like to clarify that. Because then the type of conversation or the type of feedback that I will give might be different as well, in the sense that I'm thinking about a very particular lot and what it means to intervene there. But if it's a, a public session, I will be thinking in more general terms, you know. There's a big difference between being on a board, being an advisor, and being like a research fellow. The, the responsibilities are totally different, the expectations are different. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I don't see how with everything you're going to have to do next year, the anniversary coming up, uh, like moving very quickly, having to make decisions on the fly. I, I, I don't know how you could create an architectural board, even advisory board, um, that would have the pretense of being able to help or supervise those decisions, whatever, um, without like pissing a bunch of people off. Because I, I don't think, I really don't think you can do it. And I think you might end up setting expectations where um, yeah, it's just going to be like, there's going to be a misalignment between what you need and what's able to be provided by this structure. Um, that's, that's my sense. And that, yeah, and that's no, I, I think Troy has a point and, and he's very smart in thinking that he's acting as a consul, consultant. I wasn't thinking of myself as part of a board, but I was thinking that we were a, like, my idea was that we were a working group that have certain uh, freedom, but then in a way that we were thinking through the site, what could be the possibilities of the site in terms of different positions and different understandings of the history and the presence. And then those type of, then could become something for the conversation outside, but also something that could inform a possible competition or call or uh, of brief for appointed architects. So that's why, your message today took me out of guard because I was like, eh? so then I don't understand what we are doing because, so that does a little bit to explain. So if I will be more aware of what is the role that we have and we all agree, maybe I can say, yes, I identify myself with that position or no, well, I just think it's not the case. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's discuss this next week. Or even later this week, but I'll send it. I need to Tate. I need to. <laughs> I need to dress up. Actually, <laughs> my first opening cooking section is. This oh week. yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, nice. Say, say hi to them. London wanted to be on the invite list. <laughs> <laughs> I should do <say> that. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Enjoy. Well, see you, everyone, and uh, well. Thank you. Have a great week. Okay. Bye. Bye. Ciao.